Mike already welcomed you to our morning service. I just want to say one more time, we, thank you so much to Mountain View Community Church for allowing us to use their, their video equipment to record our Sunday morning service. I trust that everybody is doing uh, very well this morning. Uh, last week after the service, several people told me that they uh, watched the service in their pajamas or eating waffles or whatever else. That's great and all, but don't get too used to that because eventually we're going to get back together and be worshiping together in the sanctuary. Today, I would like to uh, continue talking about special topics. Today, the sermon is called uh, Never Be Moved. And in the last week, I've had the, the blessed privilege to talk to quite a few people, a matter of fact, a lot of people in the last week. And I've talked to the old and young, the healthy and the weak, believers and unbelievers. And, and I know that um, times like this, in uncertain times, people can carry fear with them. And I, I've was a bit surprised at how much fear so many people on all different walks of life are carrying with them during this time of uncertainty. And there's a right and a wrong kind of fear. And the wrong kind of fear is it causes us to, to isolate and to, to focus on ourselves and to, to, to uh, not think about others. And the, and the wrong kind of fear is, is caused by uh, worshiping anything that is not God can cause us to, and depending upon anything that's not God can cause us to, um, to, to have fear. Uh, the, there's a principle that, that we need to know in the Christian life, and everybody really needs to memorize that, and this principle is this. It is that as believers, we want to read life in light of God and not read God in light of life. And I think that Psalm 93, the psalmist in the 93rd Psalm, that's exactly what he is doing. He is helping us to read life in light of God. And so if you will, uh, read it here with me together. Psalm 93, verses one to five. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on his strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. This wonderful short little psalm, I believe that the psalmist helps us to face trials. When we face trials and perils in our lives, sometimes in our fear, we, we attempt to ask these kind of questions. Why? What, what is going on and, and how am I to understand this? And if we attempt to read God through our circumstances, we will get things wrong. But if we read our circumstances in light of who our God is, it will help us respond appropriately to the trials and tribulations of life. And I believe that's what's going on here in the 93rd Psalm. And we're gonna cover it in three little parts. In, in verses one and two, you're gonna see that the psalmist makes a proclamation. And that proclamation is about God. And more specifically, it's about the might of God. It's about his power and his awesome majesty. And then he, he shifts from a proclamation about God to the perils that we face as Christians. And you'll notice in verse number three that he mentions the perils, but then immediately in verse number four, he, he speaks about how God is mightier than our perils. And then finally, in the third section, in verse number five, he moves back to talking about the Lord, but he doesn't talk about the Lord as in his might. Rather, he talks about the character of the Lord. And so let's go to verse number one, and we'll look at the proclamation of who God is. And the psalm tells us about the might of God. He makes this proclamation. Are you ready? It's a very simple proclamation. He says, the Lord 
reigns. It's almost like a cry of victory. The Lord reigns. It's the might of God. He's, this is a victory proclamation. It's very similar to Isaiah 52 and verse number seven. Many of us are familiar with the verse, which says this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes uh, salvation, and who says in Zion, your God reigns. Now, in Isaiah, this is actually talking about a messenger running back to the village or back to the capital of the kingdom saying, saying that we won the battle, that the king won the battle. And yet, that's exactly what the psalmist is doing. He's, he's declaring the good news. And that's the proclamation, but it's followed by two pictures. You'll notice also in verse number one, he, after saying the Lord reigns, he says that he is robed in majesty. That's the first picture. He's robed in majesty. He is arrayed in all his glory and splendor and majesty, and he's girding himself for battle. And then the second phrase that we see in verse number two is that he is, he's putting on his belt. He's girding on his belt. And in ancient times, in battles particularly, the belt is what held all the weapons of warfare. And so the same news was carried out by the disciples is now carried out by the church. Do you remember the news that the disciples carried out? They carried out the good news. And you'll notice that we're talking about good news. As a matter of fact, the, the word evangel, evangelize, that we, that's the English uh, form of the word, euangelion, is actually a kind of a warfare term. And, and it's, it's the good news that the battle has been won. And we Christians carry the good news that the battle has been won. Jesus Christ won it for us. He, he conquered sin and death and he rose from the dead and the battle has been won. That's the good news that we carry. But the, the, the victory is by no means temporary because as you keep reading in verse number two, he says, yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from on." Uh, from of old, you are from everlasting. The picture is the permanence of the throne of God and the permanence of the earth compared to the water images in the next verse. And so God is sitting on his throne and he's not gonna be disturbed by the chaos and the, and the storms going on in the raging sea. And the connection is this, and this is what's so important for us as believers. The connection is that as long as God's throne is established, the earth will be established as well. The raging storm will not prevail against the throne of God. And so, dear believer, the, the, the Bible is assuring you that during your times of peril, God is in control. And so, when we enter times of peril, we need to remember who our God is. Remember his power. But the psalmist changes now in verse number three, and he goes from focusing upon the proclamation to focusing upon the perils that we face around us. Let's look at verse number three together. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their roaring. The image here is of storm-tossed seas. Now, we're Westerners, Westerners, we look at the beach as, as some beautiful place that we would like to go to. We'd like to sail on a boat in the ocean and that sort of thing. But the, the, the Hebrews didn't view the water that way. The, any, any kind of water, any kind of sea was considered a dangerous, chaotic place. It was storm-tossed. Have you ever been on the water when storms roll in? I'll never forget uh, many times when, in, when I lived in northern Wisconsin, I had a friend who worked at a yacht company. And he, he told me many times, he said, even on a small body of water, as small as the Bay of Green Bay, you do not want to be on a yacht, even a 100-foot yacht, when the storms roll in because it, it can be a terrifying situation to be in. There's a, there's a common phrase that uh, mariners will use or boaters will use, it says, I would rather be on land wishing I was in the water than to be on the water wishing I was on the land. 
And um, you, they can avoid the perils of the water. But many times we as Christians cannot avoid the perils of human life, can we? We, all, we, we experience these all the time. What is interesting about Christianity, though, is that so much of our hymnody, uh, hymnody, hymnody, whatever it is, um, I'm sure somebody will send me an email and correct me, whichever one it is, uh, talks about the storms. For example, one of our favorite hymns, It Is Well. You remember the, the phrase in It Is Well? Um, it says, when the sorrows like sea billows roll. And then one of my favorite hymns, The Solid Rock, you know it probably by the first line, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But in the hymn, he says, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. And so we, there are many more hymns. You'd be surprised at the number of hymns that talk about the storms of life. And in the fact of the matter is we can't avoid them. And so verse number three talks about storm-tossed life filled with danger. But we have good news as believers. And the good news is not that we don't face perils. The good news is that we have a God that is mightier than the perils. And that's, that's what verse number four says. If you read verse number four with us, he says, mightier than the thunders of many waters, Mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. You know, the, the psalmist, the psalmist is not, if I close my eyes, all of my problems will disappear. That's, that's not what he's doing at all. That's not the answer. The answer is mightier than my problems is the Lord on high. Mightier than the storm that threatens you is God the King. He rides upon the storm. When I think of this, I think about the story in Mark chapter four. Do you remember that story where the disciples and Jesus get in the boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and they get caught in a storm and they're rowing hard against the storm and, and, and the waves are crashing in and the, the, the boat is taking on water. And what is Jesus doing? Jesus is sleeping. So the disciples go down, they wake him up. Why are you sleeping at a time like this? And he gets up, he walks up, and he says, peace be still, in immediate calm. Do you remember the disciples' reaction? They ask this question. What kind of a man is this who even the wind and the storms obey? God is in control. I, I wish I had a dime for every time I've heard the phrase, the situation is fluid in the last couple of weeks. And the situation was definitely fluid. Uh, the, sometimes things were changing as fast as we were making decisions, things would change on us. The situation uh, was changing very fast. Well, verse number three, there's a lot of fluid, isn't there? Um, the fluidity, though, is not what gives me hope. What gives me hope as a believer, what gives you hope as a believer, is that God is in control. Even in this, we're not in control. It, the good news is not that we're in control. The good news is not that we can find a way to gain control. The good news is that God is in control. I like what uh, hip-hop artist uh, Lecrae said about this crisis. He said, it's not that we have lost control. It's that we have lost the illusion that we are in control. And so the psalmist moves from the power of God, the might of God, to the perils that we face in life. And then he moves back to the person of God. Notice verse number five with me, will you? Verse number five. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Your decrees are very trustworthy. You know, this verse makes a pronouncement about God. What is he saying? He's saying God is trustworthy. He is faithful and he is holy. Do you know what I like about that? This is what I like because I think you're in the same situation I'm in. We are facing times when we don't even know who to trust, do we? And his, what the psalm is saying here is that God is trustworthy, 
because his character is trustworthy and therefore his word can be trusted. Derek Kidner, the commentator said this, scripture rests on the integrity of God who vouches for its statements, promises, warnings, and commands. And one thing that we, uh, we need in time of trouble is someone who is trustworthy in his word. And I think that that's one of the most disorienting things that's going on right now. Because we, I, I believe if you're like me, you've gotten to the point where you're hearing so many different voices that you're asking this question. You're saying, is this person saying this because it's true? Or is this person saying this because they want to get to a, pers- a political person or a political view or a political party? And you ask, is what they is what this person telling me true? Uh, I don't know, I'm confused. And what Psalm 93 does, the author nails it down. He says, you can count on God's word. He will tell you the truth. What he says is trustworthy. And put your nose in the word and he will not lie to you. We need to to fight the confusion and the the peril of life by, by getting in God's word. So in the extra hours that we have to ourselves during the days and weeks ahead, one of the things that you could do for some of that time is to spend time in his word because his word is more trustworthy than any other word that we can hear. But as we think about Psalm 93 and we think about the big situation in life, we think to ourselves, yeah, but that's God. He's He's sitting on the throne. He's in heaven where everything's perfect and he's looking at the big picture and he's not affected by any of this and he's undisturbed and he controls the big things, but he doesn't really have time for me, for little people. But you know what? Nothing could be further from the truth. And so we're gonna jump into the New Testament for just a minute. And I want you to think about something that Jesus said because this is gonna become very important. In in John 14, Jesus said this. He said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I just want to draw one little aspect about Jesus Christ that I think will encourage us today, and that is this. Jesus came to earth to accomplish the most important mission the world has ever seen, and yet he had time. When Jesus was on his mission, wherever he was, he heard and he listened to people. You say, well, what do you mean? This is what I mean. During the Feast of Booths, the Jerusalem would, the, the population of, of Jerusalem would surge. Thousands and thousands of people would come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. And Jesus is in this massive uh, crowd of people on the Temple Mount. Thousands of people surging in to hear him teach. And yet, as he walks out of the Temple Mount, he's, he's going a little bit north. He hears, he sees a man who is um, born blind, or I'm sorry, born lame. And uh, this, he sees this lame man, and he's been 38 years lame by a, um, by a pool and he heals the man, and the man is able to go off. Another time, we, we know just a, a few days before his crucifixion, there is, uh, in Jericho, he's, he's walking, and there's a crowd of people around him, and they're headed up to Jerusalem for Passover, and they're all Galileans, and the people of Jericho are gathered around, and here's this blind man, and his name is Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus, the blind man, was a beggar. He was probably somebody who was just kind of an intrusion on people's lives. And he cried out to Jesus. And in that crowd, Jesus heard his cry and turned around and healed him of his blindness. You know, I have um, lots of favorite places in Jerusalem or in um, Israel. But one of my favorite churches is a chapel, is a church on the Sea of Galilee. And it's in Magdala. And if you know anything about Magdala, that's the hometown of Mary Magdalene. And uh, in Magdala, on the Sea of Galilee, here's this church, beautiful sanctuary. And below the sanctuary is a chapel called the Encounter Chapel. 
And the, this church is brand new. It's about, it was built in 2013. And in the Encounter Chapel is a mural. And uh, the mural takes up the whole wall. It's huge. It's taller than we are. And this is what it looks like. And what I love about the mural is it's telling a story. And here's a story. I'm going to bring out a point in just a minute. Jesus in, in Matthew chapter number uh, nine, is on his way to go to the ruler of the synagogue's house. The ruler of the synagogue, this rich, wealthy, um, highly esteemed, highly educated man came to Jesus and said, my, my daughter is, is sick and dying. Can you come heal her? Along the way, she died. But here's Jesus, massive crowd around him, walking with this, this important man in this um, press of people. And here's a lady, and if you'll go to the full screen, and she says to herself, behold, a woman had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years and came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. Here's an unclean woman. She's not to be around people because simple contact with other people will make them unclean. She's not powerful, she is powerless. She is not, um, uh, she doesn't have any kind of advantage, she's disadvantaged. And yet in her private thoughts, she said this, if I touch his garment, I will be made well. And the Bible says this, the Bible says that Jesus turned and seen her and said, take heart daughter, your faith has saved you and made you well. And instantly, the Bible says, the woman was made well. You know, that's Jesus. Jesus is on the throne. He's ruling the world with a mighty hand. And yet he sees you and he sees me. And he hears you and he hears me. He's not too busy for any of us. He listens, he hears and he looks and he sees. And you know what? We are called to do the same. We are called in whatever we're doing in all of our walks of lives, we, of our lives, we are to listen and we are to hear. And we are to focus not on ourselves, but focus on God and the people around us. And so I would encourage you, to realize that when God is on the throne, it frees us up from fear. It frees us up from self-focus. And it frees us up to draw our focus to God and draw our focus to other, those around us. And so I would encourage you and ask you this question. How can you show the kindness of Jesus Christ to someone in need? You know, one of the things that we need to learn during the perils of life is that God is mighty and he's in control. And we need to remember that Jesus' word is true and trustworthy. And he himself experienced trials and tribulations of life, and yet he did it with no anxiety and fear. And the good news is that we may go through this life and not see any good news in the situation ahead but there's always good news about God who is working together all things for good according to his purpose in our lives. And we can bank on that because one day we will be with him forever and ever and ever. What a wonderful time that will be. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these truths brought to us from your word. We thank you that your word is trustworthy, that your word is true, that you can be trusted, Lord. We thank you that because you are in control, it frees us up from anxiety and fear and frees us to, to look around us and to see the need of others and to be the hands and the feet and uh, the mouth and, and the ears of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will mobilize us and help us, Lord, to uh, work to accomplish your mission for us here on earth. May you be honored and glorified. In Christ's name we pray, amen.